Sorry for the delay. We will now call this Economic Development Planning Committee uh, to order. Um, per Council Rules, Council President Brady has appointed Mr. Miller as member pro tem. And so, Mr. Miller, thank you uh, for um, serving with us today on the committee. All right, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Calling the roll, um, Mr. Shrine. Mr. Shrine is absent today. Mr. Harrison? Here. Mr. Greenspan? Here. Mr. Germana? Mr. Germana is absent at the moment. Ms. Simon? Ms. Simon is absent today. There is a quorum. Also, I'd like the record to reflect that Councilwoman Conwell is in attendance. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Any public comment related to the agenda? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, no one is signed in. All right, if committee members have had an opportunity to, well, Chuck is coming in now. Um, in your package, you have the minutes from the August 1st meeting. We'll let Chuck get in. Sorry. Not a problem. Let the record reflect that Chuck Germain is in attendance. Uh, we have our minutes from the August 1st meeting. I will make a motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Minutes approved. Uh, item 5. Resolution number 2016-0158, authorizing an economic development fund business growth and attraction loan in the amount not to exceed $2 million to 105th Street Cedar Partners, LLC, for the benefit of a project located at East 105th Street and Cedar Avenue, Cleveland. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Good afternoon, Council and Loan Committee here. My name is Arnold Locke, and I'm from the Department of Development. This morning I have before you an item request for $2 million for an economic development loan for 105 Cedar LLC Partners, Partners LLC, sorry. Uh, that's a newly created entity. It's currently owned by Fred Geis and Jim Doyle. Joining me this afternoon is Jim Doyle. Uh, you'll hear from him just later, later on in my presentation uh, what this project means for them and as well as what it means for Cuyahoga County. Uh, the total project is $11 million, 121,923. This is a new development that's going to house IBM Explorer. This organization uh, focuses on hospital data and communication for in the health field. Uh, the organization is, was created by Cleveland Clinic. Uh, our partners on the deal will be uh, City of Cleveland, which will participate at a level of six million nine hundred. Once again, the county is at two million, and we will have a senior letter, lender along with the equity to cover the rest. This project will create uh, and retain. It will create sixty new jobs and retain eighty jobs here in, in Cuyahoga County. Uh, the average salary on this project is roughly 107000 The county's loan will be at a term of 10 years with a 20-year amortization with interest only for the first three years. Uh, IBM Explorer has committed to a 10-year lease. Uh, this project, once again, is a probably one of the first uh, projects slated for the uh, Opportunity Quarter. Uh, Right now, that land is currently vacant and ready for development. Um, this project also, uh, the return on investment for Cuyahoga County, the annual is roughly estimated at about $700,000. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it's a breakdown of what portions of tax benefit goes to each one of our, uh, uh, the city, the school, the state. Uh, the county piece is roughly about 154 of that $700,000 estimated tax benefit. Um, the building is roughly about 43,000 square feet, and the loan to value is about 90%. We will have a personal guarantee by Fred Geis and Jim Doyle. Uh, the county will be in a third position. Um, this time, I want to bring up Jim Doyle. Uh, that might be to add a little bit more substance as to why this is a good project for Cuyahoga County. Good afternoon. Uh, really, not to reiterate too much of what Arnold has just touched on, but this is a deal that we have jointly put together with IBM and the clinic where we will lease the land from the clinic. Probably one of the more relevant pieces of the equation from your perspective, you're being asked to take a third lien position on an asset that will be occupied by a creditworthy tenant, IBM, for a 10-year term, which matches up to the term that you will make a loan on. So now the question is, I don't think there's much of an issue of getting paid 
on your investment. Now, how do I get paid back my investment at the end of 10 years? If I'm sitting in your chair, that might be one thing I might ask. The good news here is that there will be a contract, a pre-sale contract in the ground lease that we're entering into with the clinic where they will be, on, they will pre-buy, pre-commit to buy at a specified price of $9 million, the building at the end of 10 years. Irregardless of whether IBM extends their lease or not, they will own the building, they already own the land for that purchase price of $9 million. The relevance of that to all of you is that your debt, along with the senior lender, along with the uh, city loan and my own equity, will only total about $7 million. So there will be you know, equity still all the way through this until such time as the clinic uh, takes us out in the end of 10 years. So that's your return on your investment during your 10-year holding period. Obviously, the jobs come first, but you're making a 3% return on that investment as well, and then the return of the investment at the end of the 10 years. I mentioned a little bit about the jobs that were being created. I also want to note that uh, there is a partnership with the community colleges um, for individuals that want to learn, learn the coding business. And maybe, Jim, you can talk a little bit more about how that's going to operate and what's, how that evolved. Well, and part of the discussion came in pre uh, preliminary discussions here with the county and with the city as well, with the goal of, okay, we're, we're talking about some pretty high-paying jobs, quite frankly. I mean, when you talk about an average salary that starts over $100,000, one of the initiatives we were really trying to focus on is how could we engage the, the local community, the folks that are in the area, uh, to get employed in this spot? And the honest answer is that at the entry level we're talking about, which are high-end programmers, uh, pro, uh, data programmers and the like, with $100,000 salaries and a lot of education, there's probably limited uh, opportunities, and that's the, that's the bad news. The good news is that we are getting a commitment out of Explorus to work with the community colleges that have been given a grant through the federal government for the training of computer programmers at Lakeland, at Cuyahoga Community College, and Lorraine. And those folks are going through a training program, and quite frankly, Explorus has a very real need to get good programmers that they have a difficult time bringing in and hiring locally. They literally end up bringing them in from outside. Now they're working with the county and the uh, community colleges to get into that training program in hopes of being able to bring some of the young talent, homegrown young talent, through that system with some of that grant and aid and be able to ultimately be employees at Explorers. Well, the other thing I want to add is because this is a partnership with the city of Cleveland, this project will be under the Fannie Mae, the Fannie Lewis law for construction, that all the work will be partnered with the city and those jobs, construction jobs will some go also to the community individuals. Right. Thank you. We'll open it up to the committee now for our questions, Mr. Greenspan. Great, thank you. So 10 years, 3%, correct? Balloon, yes. Balloon at the end? Yes. So interest only for 10. Interest only for th three. Three, I'm sorry. And then pr and then principal, the reigning principal you amortize over the remaining over seven. seven. That is okay. correct. The, is the building 100, will the building be 100% occupied by IBM? It will. And There's you, room to expand it. I mean, we can we can add another 20,000 square feet to this building over that 10, 10, well, at any point in time, but there'll be room to expand the building as well. Would that, how, would that in any way jeopardize I'm trying to think, usually when you see expansion plans like that, we would have a first right of refusal on, on the expansion because it impacts our our security. Our security. Is that mm -hmm. Im impacted in the deal? In the it, it really hasn't been addressed as at this point. What, what I would envision is that if the star on the moon did line up right yeah. and that did occur in year seven, uh, one of two things would either happen. We'd either recast all of the debt, put mm -hmm. it out on a new term, you'd be paid in full. Okay or reposition it in some way, shape, or form where the added value that's being created doesn't impact your security okay. in a negative way. Okay, that's great to hear. Um, Cleveland's 6.9, is that all cash, or is that cash plus in incentives? It's uh, a 108 loan, HUD 108, so it's, a, uh, it's cash. Not so, it's, a, so it's not their money, it's federal money? Yes. Right. right. Okay. The, um, the third position, who, are we in third position alone? Yes. And who's ahead of us? The city will be ahead of us and then the senior lender. And, right. and who is the senior lender? Home Savings right now is the institution that stepped up to uh, give us a term sheet on that. Okay. 
Right. This is unique. I, I like this. Can we do more of these? Uh, I'm looking forward <laughs> to more of these. You know, this is Absolutely. <laughs> All right. He has been great to work with. I mean, uh, and we've been working hand in glove because uh, this was a difficult deal to get over the top. Mm -hmm. uh, working with these two giants known as the Cleveland Clinic Foundation and IBM, right. and here's the little developer in the middle trying to make it work. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, fortunately, we've been able to. Well, Mr. Locke keeps telling us he's great to work with. So. Well, <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Greenspan. Mr. Germana. I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, we've been hearing about we're, we're uh, bonded out. We, we have the cash available for this? We have the cash available for this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Germana. Um, Mrs. Conwell. I threw the chair to um, Mr. Doyle. The Okay, I highlighted something. The 154000 that will be the county's tax benefit, is that going to be on a yearly basis? That's an annual. That's an annual. And that's calculated through the county system. So. Okay, and then the second question in regards to the training or teaching uh, from Tri-C for these uh, specific people. Would that be a certificate? Is that training for them to be able to do the coding jobs, or will it actually be an educational type of thing that they have to go through Tri-C and get a certificate for? They actually are going to Tri-C. They're going to three different community colleges, Tri-C, <clears throat> Lorraine, and Lakeland as well. Um, I'm not sure how the federal dollars are being allocated to each of those schools, uh, but with the goal of getting programmers trained and certified and being in a job-ready position to come into the explorers of the world and, and, and be employed. Uh, because what we've heard time and time again from Explorers, but even other prospective tenants that we have is, is the constant challenge of enough good, of trained talent in our community that, uh, to fill these jobs. Because you know, when you look at the jobs that they've committed to city and, and county, you know, from what I'm planning for, I mean, there's going to be plenty more jobs than what they're even promising you. I see, I mean, I'm building this to house you know, easily 300 jobs. Well, well, I want to add to that. Um, and our, our job com commitment is within three years. They did give us some information that they're estimating around 295 jobs will be created over a five-year period with an estimated payroll of about $31 million. Right. All of our numbers have been based on the minimum job requirements, but based on the growth that we've seen historically and uh, – anticipate going forward I see it even more which is part of why they have a, a very real need to identify young talent and and be in a area like this that's close to the clinic where they were uh, born out of and need to be close to their people that they interact uh, interact with rather so I also want to add that um, there's over 400 hospitals that they will be servicing not just Cleveland Clinic but over 400 hospitals throughout the United States. Okay, so I, I, IBM. Over 400 hospitals, but so I just want to get this clear. So when they when will this building be built? When and we're saying 2 years or something like that? Well, we'll start we, we expect to start next spring. Okay. Uh, and so we expect that it would be finished 12 months later. Okay, so in that 12 month time period, I'm just wondering will this, with the Tri-C and the Lorraine and the other school that you mentioned, be geared up and have these these new people trained to move directly into those positions, or they're kind of starting that to maybe once they gear up to the 300 jobs, be ready for those kind of slots? Probably more of the latter. I think that program is really just getting underway now, and so it's probably too early to expect those jobs I shouldn't say they couldn't be ready by the time the building and space is ready, but I think they're looking at this as a, a resource long term. And when you, um, when for a project such as this, and I'm sure you've done others, when will you actually be starting to look for those employers to move once, you know, the construction schedule and all that? When will you have a job fair or something like that of, of that nature? It would be when uh, anticipating that the uh, building would enjoy its certificate of occupancy and it actually be in spring of, of 2018, it would be that spring that you'd be talking about that kind of a, of a, a recruiting effort that would be going forward 
uh, and that'll be to that'll be a partly a function of where they are in the job growth needs, but um, anticipating that it will It'll be ongoing throughout. And who would, who would do the hiring for that? Is that Cleveland Clinic, IBM, or who? Explorers. Explorers itself will be the, uh, is really the, the primary party that's responsible for that. And if you could just touch a little base, a little bit on Explorers. I don't think I understand that sure. component. Explorers was founded at the Cleveland Clinic um, as part of an initiative to, for health maintenance. If you may have seen many of the commercials when uh, IBM was uh, advertising, for example, at the Super Bowl about their IBM Watson, which is their supercomputer. Well, this is the medical version of IBM Watson. And what it has done is, uh, through the efforts of the Cleveland Clinic, they have been able to garner um, medical records from patients literally all over the world. When Arnold talks about the 400 hospital systems that are part of this, that's what we're talking about. So these hospital systems load in and provide the data from many patients. And so when a patient walks in with a condition, they're able to go to the IBM Watson, the medical version of uh, Watson, and uh, out comes uh, a prognosis of what the condition might be. <clears throat> Pretty good technology. And IBM bought this. Two years ago, Arnold, I think. Uh, I would, yes. And so uh, it was. It was in the incubator stage, grew rather quickly, um, and has been housed at the clinic. And now, IBM owns them, and they are growing them rather dramatically. So now they have the capital behind them in the form of IBM to create the jobs that we're talking about and the opportunity. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mrs. Conwell. Any more questions from the committee? All right, seeing none. Uh, we will move, uh, entertain a motion uh, to move this forward. Resolution 216-0158. Have a motion. So moved. Have a second. second. Any discussion? Mr. Chair, I would just ask that my name be added to this. All right. Madam Clerk, please add Mrs. Conwell's name. Add my name also, please. Add Mr. Germana's name. Add Mr. Miller's name. <laughs> add Mr. Greenspan's name. A, 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 you might as well add my name also. <laughs> All right, if there's no further questions, um, uh, one further, yes, Mr. Miller. Is there any urgency where uh, second reading suspension is required? No, I think uh, we've got the time to be able to, uh, to meet that. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a motion and a second. We finished discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, ayes have it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Have a great day. All right. Item number two, resolution 2016-0159. Resolution number 2016-0159, authorizing an economic development fund loan in the amount not to exceed $2 million to jumpstart for administration of the Accelerated Growth Program. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Hi, Mr. Chairman. How are Mr. you? Mr. Chairman, good, good, how are you? Good. Uh, Michael May, Department of Development, Economic Development Administrator. Uh, pleased to be here today to introduce a loan that the county is proposing to do to the Growth Opportunity Partners Incorporated. Um, Basically, the county wishes to encourage the growth of small minority and female-owned businesses and to assist in bolstering the conditions for their success through its new accelerated growth program for small business lending. You may recall that this was uh, done in a request for qualifications. Uh, it's RFQ 36307. Uh, we sought uh, a partner to identify, encourage, and develop uh, such small to medium-sized businesses and to further their realistic growth plans more efficiently and effectively and with less risk to us through this program. The county chose the proposal submitted by the Jumpstart Inc. affiliate Growth Opportunity Partners Inc. for the administration of the program and the utilization of the loan proceeds uh, for these purposes. So the Accelerated Growth Program will use this monetary resource, again, in the form of a loan to Growth Opportunity Partners, and which will also be guaranteed by its parent, Jumpstart, Inc., 
to provide technical assistance and credit products, i.e. loans, offered by Growth Opportunity Partners through flexible credit vehicles, which are not currently offered by other financiers in the small business capital space. Uh, so the uh, $2 million loan, uh, which um, would be leveraging, and this was a requirement of the RFP uh, or RFQ to leverage additional millions of dollars uh, for a pooled fund much larger than just our $2 million. The requirement of the RFQ uh, stated that we needed to have at least a total fund of $9 million, um, again, i.e. Uh, uh, leveraging another $7 million off of our two. Uh, and then again, it would be in the form of a loan. The terms of which are, this will be a seven year loan. The per annum rate will be five year, uh, five percent per annum. The principal and interest payments will be deferred until the end of that term, completely deferred until that time, but the interest rate again at five percent will be accruing. The uh, growth partners, opportunity partners, will repay the county loan and Jumpstart uh, will provide at that time and they'll provide a sufficient guarantee so as to ensure loan repayment by providing either a letter of credit or a suitable pledge of the equity resources that it has to repay the loan in full. It's balance sheet in effect uh, for the, uh, at, the full, uh, at the full amount with the interest uh, at the term of the loan. Mm -hmm. They'll be responsible growth opportunities will for the, uh, the full operation of the accelerated growth program on behalf of the county. Uh, that'll include everything from outreach and marketing of the program, intake, applications, processing, uh, microloan underwriting, uh, investment, uh, the closing and disbursement of those loans uh, to the businesses and all other sundry financial management and reporting and they'll review and select loan recipient candidates from the applicants based on their established investment standards. Uh, and then they'll also measure and report program uh, performance according to uh, certain charts and, uh, and mechanisms that we've created, uh, the impact and the trends in measuring performance um, in terms of, um, you know, again, a, a, a whole series of metrics, whether it's do dollars leveraged, follow on funding, job creation, job placements, uh, payroll growth and uh, uh, demographics of the borrowers. So that's uh, essentially an, uh, the overview of the program. I'd like to uh, uh, ask Michael Jeans, who's president of Growth Opportunity Partners and also representing not just that organization, but Jumpstart Inc., its parent, to go further into detail as to the, uh, the program's uh, components and uh, the types of loans uh, that will, uh, will be made and uh, what activity, all told, will be happening over the next th seven years via this program. So, Michael. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Councilman, Councilman, thank you for having me today. Uh, I um, I've prepared a presentation for you to uh, share a bit of detail on uh, our work at Growth Opportunity Partners. Wanted to take maybe 30 seconds to share with you uh, a bit of my background. I am from Northeast Ohio. Uh, I'm a native. I've decided I, I've chosen to stay in this community. This community has been a community that I've enjoyed watching investment in and watching uh, wrestle with economic and community development and, and, and the, the indicators look like we're, we're coming out on the right side of that. My uh, background professionally is with accounting with KPMG, securities with Morgan Stanley, and a long uh, banking career. In banking, I worked in just about every area of the bank with the exception of retail branch uh, network banking, although I had responsibility uh, over branches and I had not worked in dealer finance, although I had financed uh, automotive dealerships from time to time. So uh, my background is a finance background. It's a background where I've enjoyed making loans to small businesses, to mid medium sized businesses in and around uh, Northeast Ohio. I've had responsibility for the state as well as Michigan for the same types of lending. And one of the things uh, that I learned over that over time is that capital alone is not the solution. And I think maybe some other folks arrived at that conclusion before I did. Uh, but some of the businesses that haven't had access to some of the resources that I could provide or my companies that I work for could provide a KPMG or Morgan Stanley, that those resources just didn't make, under, make it to underserved communities. Uh, and so being able to focus on this work is uh, a privilege for me. Uh, I'll get right into the slide and, and feel free to ask me 
any questions that you may have. But the purpose for Growth Opportunity Partners is, uh, you know, we exist to, to bring high quality and we focus on that high quality resources to small businesses that are located in under-resourced uh, uh, communities and, and to benefit under-resourced per, uh, persons. We want those persons as well as those communities to grow and thrive. And, and uh, it's difficult to make uh, an informed decision without having uh, quality resources uh, upon which you can rely. I wanted to give some background on the industry and kind of where we're positioned as an organization. Uh, Growth Opportunity Partners is uh, has an application in to be a community development financial institution. And on the left side, you'll see that the, the acronym is CDFI. There's a fund that's part of the Treasury Department, U.S. Treasury, that's focused on this work. Um, the, the work really began in the mid, mid to late 60s, I want to say 67. And, and uh, this fund was established in 1994. Since then, uh, $2 billion have been awarded uh, to support various focus areas. Those focus areas can be for Native Americans, low-income persons. It, it varies across the state depending upon the, the demographics. Uh, as well, over uh, $40 billion has been deployed in the form of new market tax credits. On the right is an organization called Opportunity Finance. They're called OFN. And OFN uh, is, a, is a bit of a trade organization, if you will. They are the organization that the Treasury uses to manage CDFIs, aggregate information, uh, hold certain benchmarks. Uh, there are a total of 250 members uh, within OFN of CDFI and CDFI-like organizations. And those members have uh, loaned into the market over $35 billion in financing to urban, rural, and native communities. The last uh, point on the right side I think is worth noting. I think oftentimes there's a correlation that's perhaps miscorrelated between inner city businesses, disadvantaged communities, and risk. Uh, the cumulative charge off rate for those 250 CDFIs, uh, part of OFN, is less than 1%. And so I think it helps you get a, uh, have an appreciation for how those CDFIs are managing uh, the risk, not avoiding it. So our mission is to offer community development products, their loan products, the services, the solutions to growing small businesses that are primarily located in uh, low to moderate income communities in Northeast Ohio. Growing is, a, is important for us because the, we don't want to fund something or business that only lasts for the life of our loan and creates blight afterward. We want to fund businesses that, and we are funding businesses that are growing, that are hiring what you'll hear later on meaningful wage jobs and making an investment within the community. So it's coaching, it's capital, it's the combination of the two, both being quality. The coaching needs to be the same quality of coaching that uh, is provided to more established companies. The, 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 uh, the basis may just be different. The capital needs to be capital that fits the business and the business's plan and the, and the leadership team. And if we put those together at the end of the day, we don't just benefit the business, but we benefit uh, lower income or, or uh, disadvantaged persons. This is just a, a chart so that you could see what are the characteristics of our small business clients? What do they look like? And we, and we call them clients for a reason versus customers because it's an ongoing relationship. It's not transactional for us. Uh, but I think it's worth noting that 100% of our portfolio to date is with small businesses in Cuyahoga County. And the proceeds from the accelerated uh, growth loan uh, program would go to help us uh, build out our, our make, have more impact in the community. And on a blended basis, we would be able to fund over 40 Cuyahoga County small businesses. The number of businesses might be a lower number than you would see from a micro lender, for example. We don't have an aspiration to reach um, as many businesses as we can and have a lower dollar amount impact. So if you work your way down this document, the average loan size, the average dollars that the small businesses need, and this number was based upon an SBA study as well as our feasibility, is around $250,000. What we've learned is that the businesses aren't always in a position to manage and cash flow $250,000 at once. And so we've instituted milestone funding where we get to know the company, their financials, their goals, their, their leadership team. And as they reach certain milestones that we help them attain, then they can unlock an additional amount of capital to help them get there. That way we're not saddling these businesses with more debt than they can afford or than they need. Real quickly here, just some macro numbers. You heard me talking about meaningful wage jobs and we'll get to the definitions, but this really gets down to how we work with the small business owner to affect the payroll and the income and the wages of uh, persons in lower and moderate income communities. 
If you start on the left there at par, this is payroll employment uh, from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics uh, since 2000. You know, start, if starting at par, our Northeast Ohio uh, metropolitan statistical areas, uh, although we're positively correlated to the national uh, uh, payroll employment numbers, we, we, uh, we were underperforming and we're, we're still underperforming. We haven't quite, we hadn't at least at the time of this reporting made it back to, uh, to par. And the MSAs that are captured here are on the right, Ashtabula, Akron, Canton, Cleveland, and Youngstown. Cleveland obviously being the larger portion. But you might say, Michael, okay, that's 2000, what happened? You know, give us some more recent numbers. So the, the numbers since 2010, they track a bit the same. Uh, you know, still a lag there. The gap not necessarily widening, and I, I believe uh, there's some early indication that the Northeast Ohio MSAs are actually closing the gap a bit, which is good. And I think we'll see the why to that later. But this is the case for meaningful wage jobs. It's not that the jobs aren't there. It's that the outputs for the jobs are simply not paying at a wage that um, will allow uh, families to, to grow and thrive or live. But getting right to Cuyahoga County, these are the numbers that we face every day. If we look at the welfare and TANF income, the average income for these individuals at uh, $7,751. When we look at minimum wage, we're at 16,000, just a little bit above. And when we look at the federal poverty rate, we're at 20,000. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult, and that's for a family of three at the, uh, the federal poverty rate. Uh, on the right side, you, you see the income numbers, and I believe maybe within the last couple of weeks, the Ohio uh, mean for income just uh, edged over $50,000 uh, per, per person, uh, but still seeing a decline in Cuyahoga County, or at least not, not catching up yet. This, uh, gentlemen, is the case for, for meaningful wage jobs. Um, at these price points, these individuals can't manage a, a house home uh, household the way uh, they could and should, or that would be healthy. As well, they're not able to contribute uh, with the community, within the community. They're not able to buy goods and services that they need. Uh, they're not able to save at rates that are healthy. Uh, and so it, it tends to create a, a cycle of, of poverty. Just a quick quote here, nothing new about poverty. The only thing that's new is that we have the resources to do something about it or get rid of it. Uh, so you know, if you if talk to any economist, prosperity is measured by wages and income. There's really no economic definition that excludes that. And so our work is strengthening the business owner to increase the um, core competencies of the individual workers, which ultimately makes them more marketable within the company, allows them to earn a better wage. That should reduce turnover within the company because we found that these ladies and gentlemen are leaving these businesses to make 10, 20 cents more at a business around the corner or, or up the road. They don't tend to go far but they don't go far for much. If we can invest in their core competencies, then we can put them in a position of strength and they can earn a better wage. We're not advocating for wage before uh, the competency investment. Uh, so that's a big focus of ours. If we can decrease the turnover for the small businesses, that's where we're saving them money. They have to go back out and try to find these folks time and time again. We were highlighted earlier this year in the Federal Reserve of Philadelphia for our work and commitment to meaningful wage jobs. Um, what we've done is we've tied the, the commitment from the business owner to create the meaningful wage jobs uh, into the lending document. Uh, so they can't use those dollars for any other purpose. They can't use it for uh, something less than what our expectations are. And these are examples of how we uh, partner and, and serve families in Cuyahoga County. Uh, you know, there's just a level of integrity that every hardworking individual should have, uh, whether it's feeding your family, paying your mortgage, and contributing, investing in businesses that put employees on a productive career path, increasing their earnings potential. You can't save and invest what you never earn. Uh, and so get, putting folks on a platform and a path to be able to do that is something that's core to our work. Um, and, and then in terms of strengthening neighborhoods, our focus is low and moderate income communities, uh, stabilizing those small business owners so that they can ultimately become anchors, and uh, providing accessible nearby jobs in the community so transportation is not an issue. I think we just have uh, two more slides here. Wanted to give you a couple of examples. The, the, the top company is one we have consent from to provide their name. We don't have that yet for the one at the bottom, but good examples of, of the impact we like to have and that we are having. Uh, the top company is a minority-owned business. Um, they currently have a banking relationship, but uh, they had some challenges in their performance uh, in recent years, and, and no real surprise to that. 
uh, but the leadership team is strong. Their client base was strong. Um, there were some leadership changes that um, caused some concern. One of the things we liked is that the current CEO, COO uh, of the, the business started out as an intern cleaning a broom closet. And uh, then he became an intern and got to learn about entrepreneurship and credit and running a business. And he's now the chief operating officer. And he's created a, a platform for young men and women who are in junior high and high school to learn about entrepreneurship. It's not formalized. And so we've helped them formalize that program so that the 700 plus young men and women who've come through their doors to learn about small business ownership and entrepreneurship can all receive the same quality experience. Uh, we were able to uh, fund that curriculum for them, reduce their overall cost of debt, and increase their profitability. And we're able to do that in about seven months for it to, to show on the financial statements. Uh, they were excited about that, and so were we. And uh, they have so far created three new me uh, meaningful wage jobs. The second company is a husband and wife team. The wife owns the majority of the business. It's a transportation company. Just so you know, transportation is very difficult for banks to finance. And and these folks have a fleet that is a quality fleet. But one of the things they wanted to do was share some of the, the successes of the business and the good times. And so they have committed and have already begun to uh, take their average wage, excluding officers, from $9.50 an hour to $13.50. Uh, and then some of the folks who had been there longer and have more responsibility, even a $15.50. Our role there is to make sure that their big hearts doesn't have an adverse effect on the business and the business isn't there to keep these folks employed. Uh, we're working with management to create a plan to manage the business, not just the vehicles. So this is the last slide, our commitment to community, to provide a minimum of $12 million in capital to small businesses in the area, to create or retain a minimum of 105 meaningful wage jobs. And a meaningful wage job is one that has a path beyond living wage. And for Cuyahoga County, a two-adult, two-child home has a living wage calculation of $13.51 an hour. That's about $28,000 a year. So we say a path beyond living wage. We've got to get these folks on a path before we can actually get them to the wage. But we'd like to see career pathing that goes beyond that. So we need to see uh, a, a wage that's healthy, a path, and, and one of the following things. Health care that's paid for in part uh, by the company or sponsored by the small business. Uh, pay time off so that the employee can actually take themselves or their child to get the health care they need without being docked pay. Uh, and retirement plan, because we talk about wealth in low-income communities, but the mechanism we know that most employees of organizations or businesses, uh, the way they attain their wealth or build their wealth is either by home ownership or uh, some kind of retirement plan. We plan to touch uh, over three the, the three-year period, 600 small businesses, and refer 300 of them to the kinds of services that they need to grow and thrive. So I wanted to give you a sense of the work that we're doing, um, and I'll open up the floor for any questions you may have for me. Thank you. Such great information. We'll open it to the committee for questions. Mr. Greenspan. A couple questions. One to the chair. Do we need to substitute growth partners? Uh, yes, we, uh, we will, but after okay. we can go through the questions, we'll okay. come back to it. Um, great. I have some other questions. The, the growth partners, how long have you been around? Two years. I was brought in at the end of uh, April of 2014 to create the company for Jumpstart. The thinking that it was initially it would be a program of Jumpstart mm -hmm. turned out uh, borrowers have rights to privacy and there were some legal reasons why we needed to create the separate company. So who, who, who are the equity partners, equity owners in Growth Opportunity Partners? Jumpstart is the provided the seed capital for the organization for $1 million to launch. Growth Opportunity Partners is a nonprofit, so there's no ownership of Growth Ops, but Jumpstart is the sole member of the organization. There's a separate board of directors mm -hmm. to preserve the, uh, the legal structure of governance. However, there's an advisory board or committee that's comprised of uh, members, in part, members of the parent company or the sole member Jumpstart. And um, I don't see it listed in here. So the, the <coughs> ask is for $2 million um, for the administration of the program. If I'm reading that, I'm reading that we're paying you $2 million to administer a program not to provide funding for other entities. So what is the, is there no, an administ that's, that's not correct, uh, Councilman, that basically that $2 million is capital toward the pool. So that will be lending capital inside of the pool to, uh, that, that will. So be growth opportunity partners is getting no administration, correct. administrative. Correct. All right. We may need to, if I'm reading, 
Yeah, if I'm reading that, it says for administration of the program, section one. I don't know what the loan document says. Well, but the, it, uh, if you parse that, basically, uh, Councilman, the, the, this isn't $2 million uh, to uh, pay for administration. It basically is to provide the capital um, and I, I agree with the, the drafting here. Basically, the the, um, the point is that the, the growth opportunities partners will be administering this program, but will do that with its own resources. Uh, all right, we need to wordsmith both in the, uh, from my perspective, I'm not comfortable voting this out with the way it's written, both in the resolution, short language, or in section one, nor have I seen the documents to understand exactly what's going on. That supports this, but this this says for for administration of the program. I'm reading this. We're paying you two million dollars to administer the program. So I had questions regarding the loan amount and the administration. But what you're saying is zero administration fee. This two million is part of a nine million dollar fund to which our two million will not be released until it'll be reserved, but not released until they break escrow at nine million. Is no, that correct? No, it will not wait until the other funds are raised. It will, it will, those, those funds will go immediately to Growth Opportunity Partners. So what was the, the 9 plan. million? What, I, the, my, nine well, the, way, million. the way it was explained, uh, the way I understood the explanation was this was to be $2 million of a $9 million fund. So then my question was going to be, okay, then are we not breaking escrow till the remaining seven is raised? And you're telling me no. No, and as we, we, we did this in previous instances with the pre-seed uh, program and loan to Jumpstart, as well as the early stage program and loan to Jumpstart to provide them with seed capital uh, from the county to be blended with other funds. Each scenario is the same, and that was basically we provided the entire amount uh, in the case of pre-seed, two and a half million dollars. In the case of early stage, two million dollars that that has gone directly in total to jumpstart for them to utilize, feed the fund, uh, seed the fund, blend it in with other resources. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I just I just thought the initial explanation was this is two million of nine, and then my my follow-on question was going to be. Then are we not breaking escrow till you reach the nine? No. And you're saying no. no. Okay. No. The, the, uh, again, the RFQ, the the uh, this the specifications were such that in order to qualify uh, within the RFQ, they had to commit to raising another seven million dollars to get us to nine to get the growth opportunity partners to nine million dollars to do this level of capitalization for businesses. Okay. So we're looking at. So we've got some we've got some work here that needs to be we need some, we've got some wordsmith that needs to be done um, initially because right now the way I read this it's all for administration so we'll change that um, seven years at five percent all deferred till the end if I remember the deal we had with JumpStart and I think this might be that deal is that it was one hundred percent guaranteed by JumpStart's cash not Correct. assets cash. Well, no, no, it, it, their balance sheet and, and uh, there, there is stock involved in that guarantee on those, uh, those two previous loans. So it wasn't strictly cash, it was valued assets and those assets were uh, uh, basically looked at by our attorney, you know, by our legal counsel to see what was, you know, liquid, what was, uh, you know, what would be deemed as appropriate collateral for that, for that guarantee. So, so. And Jumpstart's board, they've approved securing Correct. all of this with cash. Both boards have approved to secure uh, the loan. And what we've done is made Growth Opportunity Partners the primary borrower. So you, you actually have access to additional assets. Each loan that's made is made, uh, uh, you would have an assignment on the, the lending. Um, each loan facility that, that is issued by Growth Opportunity Partners, as well as the assets of Growth Opportunity Partners that are unencumbered, as well as the guarantee from Jumpstart. So, so I'm trying to understand the structure. So, you, you, so a a wholly owned subsidiary is secure is using as collateral a not, its parent company's assets. 
Correct. That's effectively what, what's being done. That's so. right. That's your that's your secondary source of repayment. Your primary source of repayment is the cash flow that's created from each loan that we make. And I guess Sarah, we're we you this has all been reviewed and there's there are no issues with with this type of securitizing of our debt. I didn't personally work on this deal, but um, I believe it has gone to the law department for review. Well, yeah. Uh, the, the, again, the two previous predecessors, uh, that was the model that was built, and it was uh, negotiated through with our own law department and uh, special counsel, uh, Kelty Hall. So the, well, th this is unusual. We, we've never gone through with that. We're going through effect effectively our, our securitization is, is through a third party. We've not done that before. We've done directly with direct dealt directly with Jumpstart, not with an intermediary, no, as far as right. securitizing. But, so but I, I, they're, they're almost one and the same, though, Councilman. I mean, basically, the, the, uh, the only member of Growth Opportunity Partners is Jumpstart, Inc., so there, there is an uh, alter ego there that basically says if Jumpstart, Inc. is... Uh, is, um, yeah, but if our indebted, if, if the indebtedness is between Growth, Partner, growth Opportunity Partners and they, they default... They they, uh, let's say they, they just they just cease to operate. I just want to make sure that since the securitization is through another entity, that our legal department has reviewed that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we're we're just at the very early stages, and if if and when this uh, uh, legislation is passed, basically we will have to negotiate a a, a brand new contract with jumps with growth opportunities and with Jumpstart Inc. as a co-signer if you will, uh, through our legal department and, and also probably outside counsel. But that doesn't say that in, in this in this piece of legislation. This piece of legislation just says we're, we're agreeing to, to, uh, to loan Growth Opportunity Partners $2 million. It says nothing about the securitization. It doesn't even reference, well, it says to, she'll execute all documents, but it doesn't come back to us. That's so what we're doing is effectively agreeing to loan Two million dollars. Yeah, no, absolutely, you're correct. So there, there's uh, no securitization. What, what, so. what I would suggest, uh, Councilman Greenspan, is to basically go back to the legislation, uh, the resolutions that were built for the pr for the two other programs that were again, albeit different shelf space for loans uh, and and different uh, uh, business uh, uh, borrowers and arenas, uh, but the same principle and the same formula. Is in place Look, I, here. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. A, I'm not objecting to the concept no, of what's going on. I'm right. objecting to the. I'm not objecting, but I'm challenging the vehicle in which we're doing it. No, that, that, that's all. I mean, this you know, yeah. you know, right. there there are challenges yeah. with this, right. with, with this even before amended, uh, if we even go that far. Um, and then my, a, my a similar uh, structure, Councilman, with PNC Bank and with Cleveland Foundation, where we're the borrower and Jumpstart is the corporate guarantor. Mm -hmm. One uh, for Cleveland Foundation is five hundred thousand dollars, and the arrangement with PNC is two million dollars. And in both instances, Jumpstart has agreed. Their board has, and both boards have agreed, absolutely to this structure. Absolutely. How do you have any? I don't know what your balance, what Jumpstart's balance sheet looks like, but your cash is significantly, or your assets are significantly restricted. I mean, if, if you, you just named off four and a half million dollars, and we've done a previous deal, mm -hmm. Mike. What was our previous deal? Was it two million? Two, two and a half and two million. So yeah. So we've got four million. and a half. Right. So you've got about nine million dollars of your ba your balance sheet of Jumpstart's balance sheet that are completely encumbered. That's right. And it's a it's a shorter term, and I, I think it's the healthy way to do it. As a finance guy, I would not advocate for taking on that much debt for an organization. Um, the reality is that there are some planned exits, uh, not uh, investments that you hope will come, but planned exits year over year that uh, more than satisfy this debt. So the, the expectation of Jumpstart, which has historically been a debt-averse organization, is as these exits uh, occur, that debt is retired. To oh, I know. I've, I've, been CEO, I've been a CEO of one Jumpstart company and brought another company to Jumpstart, so I'm familiar with their process. I'm also familiar with their success and failure rates as well. Sure. So that's why I bring up those challenges. And my only other question before, and I'll turn it over, uh, these will, our money will only go to Cuyahoga County businesses, correct? Absolutely. Okay. All right, then I'll come back later, Mr. Chairman, on if challenging whether we, it's even ready for us to vote on. But I'll Thank you. Also, in the in the back of the uh, packet, they gave us a, a summary of some of the additional details 
um, as well about the interest rate term, et cetera, that he, he kind of covered already. Uh, are there any more questions from the uh, committee members? Mr. Germana, Mr. Miller. Can I just ask a uh, simple question? This accelerated growth program that's, that's your program, that's not the county's? No, that is the county program. Okay, so it's the county's accelerated growth program. Correct, correct. For yeah. small business lending. Correct. So then what we're saying is Growth Opportunity Partners is administrating the accelerated growth are the, the county's program. Is that what we're saying? It, I guess a better way to put it, uh, Councilman, is it, it will be operating it. It will be the lender. It will basically utilize our funds blended with other funds. So I think that the, the, the uh, actually the moniker of administration is a, is a, is a, 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 a uh, an inadequate one. Basically, this is all about them uh, operating a, a fund uh, through growth opportunities that's going to lend to these, uh, to these various businesses. Uh, and again, it, it's, it's not just the paperwork, it's not just the, uh, you know, it's not gonna be sort of uh, the uh, general administrative things, it's going to be literally the bank that's going to be making this lending, doing this lending to businesses on, on our behalf, if you will, by us providing the funds that we can provide toward that overall endeavor. Uh, and again, the, the, the RFQ was built on the idea, first and foremost, well, two things. One is that Cuyahoga County probably can't do this kind of lending as well as an entity like Jumpstart Inc. and Growth Opportunities uh, Partners. Uh, and secondly, uh, we, uh, and with that, um, you know, in terms of the, you know, underwriting and the risk uh, aversion that we have on, on this sort of thing. We're trying to basically get that risk uh, into the hands of somebody that can do this better than we can. So I, that's really the key. We're basically providing funds to a pool, to a bank, to an operation that will do this kind of lending for us and then give us our money back at the end of, of seven years so that we're basically, we've accomplished all of this with the right players uh, and getting the uh, money back into our revolving loan fund to do other things or similar things or, or you know, whatever. Can I, I, I get it. Yeah. It's, so, it's, it's, it's just a matter of words matter. Right, absolutely. And, and absolutely. this is not correct. saying that. Correct, correct. I, I, I agree. Um, I, agree. And but I, I, have, I have no objection right. to it. I, I think it's a good program and uh, right. we, they got the backing. Right. So we just... We so just got to we need correct. to do some drafting. So, um, yes, Mr. Miller, go ahead. I have a question as to uh, what you anticipate the uh, the average length and the typical terms of, would be of the uh, loans that you make with the businesses. Great question. Our credit policy allows for terms as long as seven years. Our uh, as practitioners, we're not interested in doing anything for seven years with such a, an early um, size of the portfolio. Uh, so the, the shortest duration would be what, what banks call a bullet loan, which is a one year. That would be a gap kind of finance to help them uh, close a, a meaningful loan with a financial institution. Our average term is five years uh, or 60 months. And if necessary, there's been one instance where we had to do an interest only for three months as the company relocated into the city, uh, we didn't we didn't want to encumber that or, or get in the way of it. We have a okay. formal credit policy as well. Uh, it's it's very yeah. in depth. It has a risk rating system that's attached to it, and so we have to adhere to the policy. Uh, anything outside of policy has to go to the board of directors. And uh, what's the uh Typical interest rate, and uh, and do any of these loans have features where if the uh, company does very well that you share in the profits? The average interest rate is between eight and nine percent. 
we do not share in the profits of the company. We simply want to help these companies be stronger uh, and be able to have more impact within the communities that they already operate. So we do not share in the upside as an investor. We're simply the debt that they can't get today, either in uh, at all or in structure or in amount from a traditional banking uh, institution. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, just two, two further questions, if I can. Yes. One, do you take it at an, an equity interest in these companies? We do not, but we do require personal guarantees from these small business owners, and and so there, there are layers of support. Do you take a board seat? No. Okay. No. We, we do, it's probably, uh, this would be a different process maybe than most are familiar with, and that is we require monthly financials uh, from the company. And on the traditional banking side, you get annual. Sometimes they get quarterly, but that's typically when it's a distress scenario. We get monthly and we model those. We use the same underwriting software as the banks use, Moody's, but it's uh, more affordable called web equity. So we're spreading cash flow. We're spreading their liquidity rate, their leverage uh, on a monthly basis. So we'll see stress way before the business owner will in the company. And that's our role, to get them stronger uh, so that they can perform and compete against larger competition. Uh, as we continue to be successful there, these companies continue to grow and thrive and hire. I'm just wondering, what are the, the qualifications? Because um, you're weeding out, mm -hmm. and of course, we're always subject to criticism, and then sure. they'd, they'd be saying, well, what the heck are you putting the, for this? Mm -hmm. uh, and not allowing my company to mm -hmm. get this loan. Yeah. Well, what are, what are some of those qualifications? Absolutely. So the first thing we do when we receive a request, we, we model it up like we do all the other requests. And if we find that this is a bankable deal, we have the relationships with our banking partners at leadership levels to be able to present with the consent of the borrower to the financial institution with them or on their behalf. So our first pass is to maybe help them communicate better and package better the business they're already doing. Uh, but banks typically have a cash flow ratio for, within small business of between 1.2 to 1.3 uh, over 1. Basically, the business has to be able to cash flow its debt 1.2 times or 1.3 times. Our uh, benchmark is 1 to 1. They need to show that they can afford the debt that they currently have, which would include the debt that they're requesting from us. And remember, our requirement is that they're growing companies. So we're not looking for the hockey stick that shows that they're high growth. We just need to see that there is meaningful growth within the company that will allow them to have impact and accomplish their goals. So one-to-one, -one, as we continue to work with them, should culminate into a 1.1-to-1, 1.2-to-1. And at that point, we are off uh, uh, boarding them to the traditional banking solutions. Or, even better, they're able to retire their debt and not have to have debt on the balance sheet. They'll give themselves a pay raise if they didn't have the interest uh, expense that they have by incurring and maintaining the debt that these companies keep. What, what about size? Yeah, the uh, so we have some target sizes in here, but we've seen some of the companies come in a little bit smaller. And, and with their interim financial statements, we've been able to get comfortable with some. And some we're just continuing to coach and advise until they get there. Uh, but the floor that uh, our target floor is half a million dollars because $100,000 is our target low end on the loan size. Uh, the the ceiling, uh, it's been pretty interesting. On the advisory side, we've uh, worked with a small business that is at over $40 million and has bank debt, is minority owned in the city of Cleveland. And uh, I worked with them over the years and we get a lot of our business that way. Um, either I've worked with them or my chief credit officer who's been underwriting small business for over 20 years. Uh, at traditional banks, recently from Key for 10 years, 10 years before that with Huntington. We've seen a lot of these businesses. We recall their plans so we can look back and see whether they've executed. And so, uh, you know, the size can get high, but but in a $40 million range, just not much our 500000 or 400000 or 200000 can do. So at that point, we're, we're working with the leadership team, the CFO, the controller, to understand well, where's the stress in the company? Are they just not converting their receivables to cash fast enough? Are they not pricing appropriately? Where are the holes? Because at $40 million, they should be operating a viable company if they have the right model, right? Uh, I think the sweet spot's probably between a half million dollars in revenue and maybe eight or nine million uh, in, in company revenue. And, and 
we want to have a balanced portfolio because if everything's on that three, four, five hundred thousand revenue size, and these are smaller loans, then those companies will have less impact than we'd like to see them have. We would have less impact for those companies. We refer them typically to ECDI, or if it's real estate driven to Village Capital. Uh, we're reserving our space for the growth of the company because that's the part of their model that's typically underfunded. So, uh, is real estate or equipment uh, a part of this? We do not make loans for real estate for the sake of a company buying real estate because there's no economic correlation between real estate and, and the growth of a company, right? The real growth metrics. Uh, it can accommodate growth, but it's not really a driver of growth. However, we will take real estate for collateral to secure the loan. We wouldn't want a business owner who has a building worth a million dollars, owes 100000 on it, to have a loan from us and have that building free and clear and go out and take out a seven, dollars $800,000 loan. That would jeopardize our repayment, our source of repayment. So we tend to manage tightly the equity uh, and the borrower's ability to not only repay us, but to continue along their growth track. And the only way to do that typically is to uh, strengthen the loan by real estate that they might have that might have some equity. But we don't do investor real estate. We don't do real estate for a company to move and buy a building and put their business in it. We would partner with uh, traditional banks, community development, um, village capital. Yeah, that's where we would focus so that they can do that part. And if you think about it, the development and the developers who focus on real estate, they don't necessarily look at the strength of the business that occupies it. If we can take their investment, not, not net operating income, and, and that's what makes these development, these real estate development projects work, and we can put inside of those buildings viable small businesses that can afford to pay the leases, then the projects work and the development uh, has a better shot at making it. So not real estate, but what about vehicles and manufacturing equipment? Vehicles in the in instance of the um, transportation company, because each vehicle is tied to revenue. Manufacturing equipment, we love because we can drill down to the business owner how much revenue they should be generating from each piece of equipment that they're using. Specifically, in the manufacturing space, we have in Northeast Ohio some, um, you know, maybe dated um, manufacturing processes and companies. And so we're trying to work with the business owners to, uh, let me take one moment. There's a correlation between companies that invest in their equipment and technology as well as sell into broader geographies. And so those are two things that we reinforce with our small business owners. If they're operating with old equipment and they're trying to compete against their larger uh, competition that has newer technology, uh, they're just inefficient and it's tough for them to price effectively and still run a viable business. So uh, yes, manufacturing, we really like equipment because there's a correlation to, uh, to uh, upkeep of equipment and technology and the, and the well-being of the company. Um, but we do want them to be able to compete and not just have to grow and be big to compete, but to be to be efficient. Is there uh, qualifications as far as race or ethni ethnicity? Ethnicity, yeah, we do. Um, so we have two priorities. One is that disadvantaged persons have access to this capital. And what we found across the country and the region hasn't been exempt from it, is that minority persons have disproportionately uh, not had access to traditional bank capital. When they've had access to it, it's been uh, at a higher cost or with more covenants and more collateral. And so um, that is a focus for us to help unravel that. We often find that minority persons, when they don't have the access to traditional capital, uh, they, they go to other sources that cost more and that are more complex and don't fit the business. And it's those very um, uncoordinated structures that when that person goes to the bank with their business for a loan, the bank looks at it and says, you've got too much credit card debt, too much uh, personal debt. Uh, it's uncoordinated. And those are the things that we provide for in our, in our uh, credit policy. Uh, so that's a focus. Uh, women business owners, uh, they, they tend to track behind minority business owners in terms of having access to capital. And so that's a focus for us, uh, working with folks like uh, Mel at, at We Can Code It, because coding, uh, Jeff Emmold, I think about three, four weeks ago, said every new employee at GE is going to have to learn coding, right? That's, that's I think, sending a message to the business community that coding is, is going to be core to the, the workforce. And so working with folks like uh, Mel, who has programs and verticals directly uh, for young women uh, to learn coding and enter a space that's typically male-dominated. Uh, so yeah, those are focus areas. 
At the same time, if there's a majority business owner, and we've made these loans as well, who is, and so this is talking about the overall portfolio, who is invested in the low-income community, he's hiring from that community or she's hiring from that community, then ultimately that improves the economics of the community. And so we don't, um, we don't discount the value of that, and you need a bit of both to really make a community a healthy community. So our portfolio overall um, uh, is today, and we hold it to be a diverse portfolio that reflects the overall community. As well, we hold those same requirements and expectations for staffing and for our board and other governance roles and our vendors. Okay. Sounds like a great program. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Mr. Jamel. Do we have any more questions from the committee? All right, see you now. In your packet, we have a proposed substitute that um, crosses out Jumpstart Incorporated and insert the name Growth Opportunity Partners Incorporated like we've heard here today. Uh, in addition to that, we've had some discussion about the language of how it reads in terms of what the $2 million will be used for, whether it be for administration, whether it be used as capital uh, for the program. So uh, staff has prepared us uh, a, a brief um, change of, uh, that we can insert, which reads $2 million to Growth Opportunity Partners Incorporated to be used as capital for the Accelerated Growth Program to be administered by Growth Opportunity Partners. So I believe that that covers the concerns about what the what the uh, two million dollars will be used for, and who will be administering the uh, the program. It's also my understanding that the RFQ has set out guidelines, et cetera, about moving forward. And we've been told by Sarah that she she although she has not looked at this, but she believes the law department has gone through this thoroughly as well as the uh, development. I see a head nod from uh, Sarah Parks in the back that they have thoroughly uh, vetted this this program and, and deem this to be uh, one of worth, that is worthwhile for us uh, for support. So I will make a motion to um, approve the proposed substitute that amends that, that name and then we'll go back and insert the amendment as it relates to the $2 million language. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. All right, so now we will make the amendment to the proposed substitute that, that spells out the $2 million to Growth Opportunity Partners Incorporated to be used as capital for the accelerated growth program to be administered by Growth Opportunity Partners Incorporated. In, in, in all relevant places, yes. It, it, <laughs> That's not part of the amendment, but as long as it's on the record that it will be amended in Absolutely. all relevant places. Right. Uh, we have a motion to set. Yes. And I... Am I correct in presuming then that, that in the title where it says for administration of the accelerated growth program that that sentence would be deleted? Correct. That would be deleted. Part of the replacement and then we would continue with authorizing the county executive. Da -da 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 -da. Absolutely. Okay. So it will be uh, inserted uh, where needed uh, to, in, inside of the uh, resolution and then it will continue from there. All right. Well, we have a, 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 set, a motion in a second on the proposed substitute as amended, right? Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. And the ayes have it. So now we need to move this from committee under second reading suspension. Am I, Janine? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, no one is signed in for public comment. Okay. So we, we don't need to, so we're good. Uh, yes, you're good. Okay, we're fine. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, um, yes, it does need to be moved out of committee. Okay. All right. So we will... Um, and, and my second reading suspension? Yes. So second. Second reading? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Yes, we would like that. Oh, we could do yeah. three. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, no, no. This is, time is of the essence. I'm All saying. right. And so I will again... Um, Make a motion to move the proposed substitute as amended uh, under secondary suspension to the full council. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Seeing none. And Mr. Miller, Mr. Jamana's name? Mine too. And Mr. Miller's name? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay too. So all of our names to the uh, to the proposed substitute as amended. Uh, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? All right, I have it. Thank you so much. Thank we you, got you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, All Councilman. Right.
but absolutely. Sorry for the hiccup. Any miscellaneous business? Seeing none. Any other public comment? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. All right, meeting adjourned. Thank you. Okay.